Aripa, um, we're being recorded, um, was born and raised in Milwaukee and has been a dedicated community activist working to better the lives of others by creating positive change. Um, their first public service career began in 2010 where she made history by becoming the first Latina elected to the Wisconsin State Legislature. There she served in the legislature for five terms before making history once again in 2020 by becoming the first Latina and first openly LGBTQ member of Milwaukee's Common Council. And so she looks forward to advocating for her constituents on Milwaukee's near South Side. And her priorities include fighting for equality for all people, supporting public schools, creating family, supporting living wage jobs and keeping um, her community safe. Next, as I said, is Francesca Hahn. She represents the 76th Assembly District in Madison, Wisconsin, as well as um, she is the first Asian American state legislator in Wisconsin history. She's a second generation Wisconsinite, mother, community organizer, and service industry worker. Hong is the daughter of hardworking immigrants who made the journey to the United States in the 1980s so that her father could pursue a doctorate in sociology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Growing up, Francesca was witness to the hard work and perseverance of her parents as a small business owner who had to work her way up from the bottom. Um, she really understands the gaps that exist between what a worker needs and how they translate to tangible resources um, that are available to employers, things like basic needs, like affordable health care, a fair minimum wage and transportation um, that really falls on the shoulders of struggling business owners um, and their ingenuity. So these issues and more um, that arose during the pandemic have called Hong to action as a comprehensive leader and a voice to create deep change within the state legislature. And um, last but certainly not least, we have Alicia Halvensleben, who has been interested in politics since watching presidential debates as a child. She volunteers for candidates while she was in college, including a friend who is a long time state representative now running for state senate. She is a team leader for democratic action in Washita that organizes volunteers for candidates. Um, and after noticing that many local elected positions go unchallenged for years, she decided to put her experience to good use by serving the community and running for common council in Waukesha where she has lived for nine years. So I think hopefully we have everybody, we have 25 people in here now. So I'm just gonna reiterate um, the point of this panel and session is just to um, hear from these elected officials. I just gave quick little um, summaries on um, why they got involved in politics, maybe how they can inspire other, maybe students to get involved in politics and why political engagement is so important. So I guess from there, I'll just ask the panelists in whatever order you please, um, feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, I'm sure you could do yourselves a little bit more justice than I did. Sure, I'll, I'll, um, I think I'm the, the oldest of the panel, so I'll go first. I'm Alderwoman Jocasta Samaripa from the Near South Side. Thank you, Katie, so much for your lovely introduction. Um, from the near south side of the city of Milwaukee, and I'm um, honored to, to um, be on this panel with Representative Francesca Hong and Alder Alicia. I, uh, oh, I'm going to say your last name wrong, um, Alicia, but she and I go way back to a few um, state democratic conventions. Um, I uh, wanted to let the group know that I, as a college student, I became very involved in politics. Really, I have to credit my aunt. I wasn't involved on um, with the college Democrats, but um, very much so in my community. I went to UWM, so I wasn't far from home going to UW Milwaukee. And my passion was really the near South side, home to the largest Latino population in the great state of Wisconsin. And I was very passionate about um, supporting and lifting up um, my Latino community where I was born and raised. Um, and it was really in 2004 when I got the most active I was working or volunteering rather. I wasn't, um, I wasn't on the payroll. I was volunteering my efforts to help John Kerry who was running for president on the democratic ticket at the time. And they had opened up uh, Unidos con Kerry Edwards Latino office um, on Chavez Drive in my district. And um, I really wanted to help get out the Latino vote. And it was that year in 04 that I realized that I lived in the district with the lowest voter turnout in the state. And something clicked in me that year that 
this was what I wanted to dedicate my life's work to increasing the vote on Milwaukee's near south side, which is also home to the largest Latino community in the state. And it is still a goal that I'm trying to pursue relentlessly. Um, we continue, unfortunately, um, to report the lowest voter turnout in the state. Um, and it is something that I want to say in the end my, that my legacy was that I increased the voter turnout, but it's something we continue to grapple with um, here on the near south side and, and something that I hope that I can work with um, folks like you, the younger generation that I'm passing the baton to, to, to help me keep getting underrepresented folks out to the, to the polls, keep getting young people like yourselves out to the polls. Because when you guys vote, when my community votes, uh, we elect uh, a more diverse elected official. And I think that we elect more women, more out queer, openly queer candidates, more people of color. And I think that that just leads to better government for all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm State Representative Francesca Hong. Um, thank you so much to Katie and Kristen and everyone for holding this space today. I'm just very, very grateful and, and honored to be with y'all and with um, uh, Alder uh, Zamaripa and um, Alicia. It's nice to meet you. Uh, I am the political newbie in the group, so I didn't quite follow the the trajectory of you know uh, organizing and working in campaigns or local government prior to uh, running for office my background is in the hospitality industry I've been in working I've been working in a restaurant since I was 15 years old uh, actually ended up dropping out of school to uh, pursue a career uh, in cooking and um, I think my call to uh, run for office uh, was because government wasn't working for the people that I cared about. And while government wasn't working, people in my community continue to work, continue to care, and continue to center community care uh, in incredibly um, difficult times. So when I ran for office in 2020, amidst crises, grief uh, from you know the crises of, of systemic racism to uh, the pandemic to just folks who have been vulnerable um, but not properly represented um, uh, lacking a voice in the state legislature so um, I decided that it's the folks who didn't know what a state representative did uh, that really deserved the most representation and so I ran for office and it was due to uh, the support of, of a community that uh, still believes that government can be different, look different, and represent people differently, um, and that we really need to start having uh, critical conversations uh, about why we are so disillusioned with, with uh, state politics right now, uh, what we need to do to help those who are caring for those in the community, uplifting that leadership, uh, and using the platforms that we do have uh, to continue to let people know that government can be a force of good, that it does not have to be like this, and that it's important to continue to listen to young, progressive, uh, community-minded leaders uh, to endorse that as the government um, and continue to try to, uh, to fight together in this because really uh, doing this work together, it's the only way we're going to start making it work for everyone. So looking forward to the discussion. Um, and again, very, very honored to be here. I guess that means it's my turn. Hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alicia. I am a little bit different than the other two because I haven't technically been elected yet, but we have a week and a half to go and uh, we're very close. So um, as uh, was mentioned, I am an aldermanic candidate at this time for the city of Waukesha. I'm actually currently staring at my polling place just beyond my computer here. So I'm very excited for the upcoming election on April 5th. Um, that said, I've actually been involved in politics for a really long time. Um, I became interested in politics as a young child when my parents' divorce was finalized. We no longer had cable suddenly. Um, and so the only choices were to watch the, uh, the debates and uh, the conventions on TV. And I actually found them fascinating. So um, it, it really sparked an interest in me as a, as a very young child. I was only um, 10 or 11 at the time. So uh, that's, that's when I really became interested. Um, but when I really became active, I would say is in college. Um, when I was uh, volunteering for different campaigns, including for a friend of mine, Mark Spritzer, who, as it was mentioned, is currently running for state Senate, which is very exciting to me because 
he started the way that I'm starting just a little bit later. Um, he started at the Beloit Common Council. Um, and so he started at the very local level, which I think is um, a great way to start. It's not the only way to start, but it's definitely a great way to start. Um, and so my involvement up until now has been more on the back end, uh, volunteering for people like my friend Mark for local candidates, all the way up to um, volunteering on presidential campaigns. Uh, one of the things that I think is most important in the way that I volunteer typically is to make sure that when I'm out talking about candidates, I'm talking about all of them and not just one candidate. Uh, I think that we get a lot of attention on these presidential campaigns. Um, they, they bring out those headlines and, and a lot of different, you know, a lot of money is involved. Uh, and so people can often forget about some of the smaller races, especially the spring races. Uh, the voter turnout is definitely lower typically in the spring. And so for me, I, I think that's really disappointing. And I hope that we can um, work to improve that. And I think that uh, we're finally seeing people taking these spring, especially nonpartisan races um, with a lot of the school board stuff that we're seeing in the news. I think it's, it's um, shining a spotlight on some of these local races, uh, not always necessarily in a good way, but it is definitely increasing turnout. So I'll take it if I, if I have to. Um, but that said, uh, I, it wasn't school board for me. For me, it's common council. Um, the reason being, I think that there is um, so much good that can be done at a very local level for the city. And if you are truly passionate about the city in which you live, I think that it's a really great way to serve your community. Um, it's something for, depending on the, the community that you live in, it's something that you can do in addition to, you know, having another job. For me, I have a full-time job um, and that's what I do normally. Uh, and then this would be my night, nights and weekends thing. Um, so it, again, it's a, a great way to get started in politics. Um, and given my experience with organizing, um, before running for office uh, as, as a potentially elected official, um, it's made it a lot easier for me. Uh, so the fact that I've volunteered on so many different campaigns, helped organize volunteers for other campaigns, it's made it a lot easier to run my own campaign this time around. Um, so with that, I'm sure there are plenty of questions and, and we've gotten into Alicia froze for me, but I think think she was finishing her statement. Um, my apologies if I interrupted her. She's a little frozen screen on my <laughs> computer. There we go. Um, this, as I said, is going to be a really open space. So along um, while people are talking, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, I can wait right now, or we can go ahead. Um, if anyone has any pressing questions, feel free to unmute right now and ask them um, of any of our panelists or of all of our panelists. Um, unmute or drop them in the chat. If not, um, we can continue with some of the pre-planned questions, but um, yes. Phoebe, your hand is raised, feel free. Hi, um, I have a question about the obstacles that women might face when they're running for office. Um, some I've been talking with some undergraduate students at my campus, which is University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and they're really surprised to learn how underrepresented women and especially women of color are in state legislatures, but also in, in local offices. And they wanna know what they can do about that. So yeah, I'd love to learn more about what obstacles women candidates face. Who wants to take that first? I'm sure all three of you have <laughs> answered. Um, that's that's a great uh, question. Thanks so much for that, Phoebe. Uh, I you know I'm very fortunate to work in a state legislature where our caucus is actually majority women, um, and so I would say the the first thing is is to reach out to uh, current elected uh, women, um, non-binary folks who are underrepresented. Uh, is and, and currently serving and ask them about their experiences and, and where they were finding support. I think some of the barriers include uh, what a lot of uh, current uh, barriers are for uh, working women and non-binary folks um, when it comes to running for office or maybe uh, pursuing um, uh, uh, climbing kind of that, that career mobility ladder is um, lack of access to affordable and um, high quality childcare. Uh, we know that, um, you know, 
know, uh, child caring responsibilities disproportionately falls on women uh, in the family right now. Um, I'm a mom of a five year old and I rely a lot on my parents. <laughs> um, and I'm very fortunate uh, to have uh, moved in with them during my campaign, um, but not everyone has that option, right? And so I think, um, you know, uh, childcare was definitely an obstacle. Another one being, you know, raising money is, is one of the most difficult parts of running a campaign, um, especially while you're trying to work and, and juggle all their things. And so um, for women, especially, it's, it's adding to our controlled chaos of, of balancing so much uh, to make sure that, that we're taking care of folks in our community or our families. Um, and so uh, the barriers also is, is just in fundraising um, and the time to be able to do that. Um, I think collectively it's it's on the responsibility of folks who are coming in as strategists or who are running county parties uh, to really take a critical look at providing uh, support, not only financially of women running for office, but look at ways that you can support them, you know, in their home. Like I think I had candidates tell me that they had some folks come out and, and help with things around the house or with groceries so that they could be on call time and or uh, be out doing doors um, that we're really looking at uh, uh, supporting women um, through uh, um, with the barriers they face, you know, in non-traditional ways. I think if we're going to be breaking barriers, we have to be breaking breaking barriers, um, you know, uh, at uh, kind of all systems uh, going. So, um, you know, childcare, uh, looking at ways to support women who are running for office in non-traditional ways, whether it's helping out the house or organizing for volunteers. Um, and then the other thing is, oftentimes we are kind of our own. Uh, uh, our own barrier, right? There is an imposter syndrome that comes with being a woman or particularly a woman of color and entering very uh, white male dominated spaces. Um, and so being, uh, finding spaces where you have support that really validate um, and celebrate uh, everything that you're doing. I think having those spaces is integral to make sure that, you know, when we do go into uh, spaces that may be more hostile for us, we remember that we have a community that supports us. go next. Um, Phoebe, you have, your question is a great question. Um, I actually was speaking with a voter yesterday, um, and it's a lot of the preconceived notions about what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a woman who's running for office, um, what it is to be a woman who's holding elected office. Um, and so there were questions about, do I have kids? Am I married? Um, and I'm, I sit there and I think, is this a question that you would be asking of my opponent? Um, is this something that is relevant? Um, he also happened to mention that the people who are currently on the Common Council are mostly older white men and housewives. That was his words. Um, and I was like, that's not me. <laughs> um, so I think that there's, uh, you know, Francesca brings up a really great point. The assumption is that if you are a mother, then you might not have the time to dedicate or you might not be able to put your full self into the job. And that's, we know that that's not true, um, but then there are those, those obstacles. Um, I'm, I don't have children personally, so I don't face that obstacle personally, but it is something that I recognize. And um, it is kind of one of those reasons that I know I have the time and the energy to dedicate without having to overcome that obstacle that I think it's so important for me um, to really step up and, and be that person that can be representing um, women's voices, non-binary voices, underrepresented voices on a common council that currently only has two women out of 15. Um, and so I think that uh, trying to overcome those preconceived notions that people have and assumptions that they make is so important and I hope that I can kind of break down some of those barriers to make it easier for women who maybe have even more obstacles than I have um, and so that they can maybe step up in, in the next round. So um, yeah, plenty of obstacles and you just have to keep pushing through it and, and just really um, you know, be your best advocate. So you sometimes will be the only person advocating for you. Um, and I think that that is, you have to know that you can do that um, it is not always easy, and I'm so thankful that I, I don't have as many obstacles to overcome and that I do have the county party support and um, that I have so many people in my life who are willing to support me as well. 
Um, so definitely have a good support system, but know that you're, you're probably also going to be your, your own best advocate. So that's the best advice I can give on that. Yeah, and I think um, Alicia and Francesca already said, hit all the main points. I just wanted to add a couple of, um, a couple of things I've observed as a woman in politics. Um, and that is um, certainly also our youth can, I, I think of a, the college kids I know I'm talking to right now. When I first ran, I was 30 years old. This was in the early 2000s. I lost the first time I ran. Um, and one of the big talking points that uh, my opponent used against me, he was an incumbent, like a 20 year incumbent, was that I was too young. And I was 30, but I, you know, I looked very young. I looked much younger than 30. And it was a very uh, successful talking point for him to come after me on, on my age and my inexperience. And I believe it was related um, to, to my being a woman as well. So it worked against me in that regard. I, you know, I, I didn't make it through the primary. You know, I lost well before the general, but I often think of that issue that our younger candidates have and particularly our, our, our younger women candidates. Um, I remember that was a tough one for me. Um, and then I also wanted to point out just recently, I've, I've asked um, multiple Latino women um, to consider running for office. And I, it, it really concerns me the amount of self-doubt that they have, that they don't, you know, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I have the capacity. I don't have the knowledge, the, uh, the know-how to be able to be a successful, whatever, you know, whatever the, the position is. And I just, I it just, it makes it breaks my heart because I'm like, are you kidding me? You should see some of some of the weirdos that are serving in elected office. I mean, if people can, the people that we know that are serving in elected office, absolutely, they can do it. You can do it and do an exceptional job. What the perspective that a woman would bring to the table is just paramount. It's priceless, in my opinion, and it kills me that I feel like I've asked multiple um, young Latino women, in particular, to consider running. And, and they really are plagued with this self-doubt. So it's something I wanna um, help, um, help to encourage women to not, please don't think you wouldn't be an effective legislator or, or alder or governor. Um, you've got what it takes. And in fact, you have more so than your male counterparts, in my opinion. Thank you. I wanna say thank you all for sharing that. I know that was a, a question on the front of my mind as well. Um, I know personally I took a women in politics class and some of the things I learned in that were, were upsetting and um, so I lit a fire under a lot of people's mind in that course. Um, if no one has any questions in the chat, we're gonna go through a couple, oh, someone does. Yes, Mark, feel free to ask. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Uh, um, and thank you all for being here. And so uh, um, I am a former county party chair um, in my community as an elected Democratic Party chair um, when I was 34 and there was, uh, and it's pretty much all Democratic community. And, you know, fortunately we were very grateful enough to have a lot of um, people who are interested in running for office. And sometimes you have a lot of really young folks coming right out of college that are really excited about getting engaged. And it's really wonderful and really inspiring but sometimes there is a little bit of a gap. Maybe they haven't worked on campaigns, haven't gotten time to know the community very, uh, very well. And, you know, I'd oftentimes, you know, encourage people to work on campaigns first, maybe get their foot in the, uh, foot in the door. Um, but I guess what would your advice be to young students who might not necessarily feel are quite yet ready, but you want to encourage their ambitions um, to go forward anyway, like not necessarily to run for office, you want to encourage them to engage, even if they might not quite be at a level where they're, um, where running for office would be the, the most um, uh, wise thing at the moment for them. I can definitely start on that one, if you guys don't mind. Um, so I think that there are so many ways to be involved in politics even if you are not currently the candidate. And I, I know I kind of touched on some of it before, but I can definitely elaborate. Um, I think that volunteering on a campaign is great. There are also um, ways to get involved with the party. Um, in addition to helping to organize volunteers, I hold positions within the Democratic Party um, at the state and local level. So 
Um, I am part of the Young Democrats of Wisconsin, serving as the vice chair there. Um, I have I currently also serve on the fifth congressional district board. That's the one that's very red, by the way. Um, so it's a little different here, but um, I because of that, it's exposed me to a lot of the resources that are now available to me as a candidate. So going into running as an actual candidate, not kind of being on the back end, I knew what I could do right out of the gate. I didn't have to try and find those resources. So I knew that I could connect with the county party to help me with, with texting, to cut turf for knocking doors, to getting things set up for phone banking, um, to making sure that I have people, I literally have people doing postcards for me right now. Um, so having that system in place and knowing that that system exists can be really important and really helpful because um, it saves you that much time. If you just decide, hi, I want to run for office and now I'm going to connect all in, in one fell swoop, it, it can slow you down a little bit because you have to kind of figure out the, the lay of the land and, and what's even available, what resources are out there. Um, so getting involved with the party or, um, or any organization, it doesn't necessarily have to just be um, whichever party you, you belong to. Um, other organizations can also be helpful, but um, you know, I chose the route of, of getting involved with my local party and, and getting involved with the state party. Um, and because of that, I've you know, been able to connect with people like Joe Casta, who doesn't live you know, all that close at all um, and is in a very different community situation than I'm in. Um, but I've been so thankful that I've been able to connect with, with her and, and with a variety of other people around the state um, who have been able to support me. Yeah, I was gonna, I just spoke to a, <clears throat> to a Marquette University class and I was trying to, I wanted to give them ideas around trainings. I know I, as a young woman in the early 2000s, there were a number of trainings aimed at getting progressive candidates to run and in particular aimed at asking women to consider running for office. And so I always credit Emily's List. That was probably one of the first political trainings I went to. It was Emily's List is focused on getting pro, cho pro women's choice, um, you know, pro-abortion rights um, candidates elected into office. Uh, I, that was one of the first trainings I attended. I also attended, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of the White House Project, which is nonpartisan. So people, uh, women of all political stripes and encouraging them on, and training them to run and win elected office. These are trainings that Camp Wellstone was one that was open to men and women, progressive. Um, I don't even know if they're still running trainings, but these were trainings that I did that were very helpful in helping me to cut my teeth and get ready. Um, because to Mark's point, you know, I had an aunt, uh, I think I mentioned her when we first start, started the panel, but my aunt, Nena, we called her, she ran when I was a little girl several times in the, it must've been the early eighties, unsuccessful. She didn't have the network, she didn't have the know-how. And um, I just always credit her because I feel like she was meant to run so that I could watch and learn. Um, but as I got older, not only did I have that experience of my aunt watching her run, but also having the opportunity to attend these trainings um, were very beneficial to me. And I helped, I think helped me to build my network in addition to learning through the attending the trainings themselves, but to build my network because some of the volunteers and donors I plucked directly from those trainings that I was able to attend where I was able to connect with like minded folks who wanted to help me run and win. So I would suggest looking in to see if Camp Wellstone is still around. I know Vote Run Lead, uh, and it sounds like I'm, we're talking to a nationwide audience. So Vote Run Lead is prominent all over the country, in particular in Minnesota, Minneapolis. I think they're going to be. Um, very soon. In fact, they reached out to me recently to see if I could join them because I'm one of their trainers. In Wisconsin, Emerge Wisconsin. Um, and if you're not in Wisconsin, I know Emerge America, you can Google them and they have trainings for democratic women across the country. So those are just a few that I would rec recommend, Mark, to recommend to your students to consider um, attending so they can start to get that experience so they can be an, a, a viable candidate who can run and win. Uh, thank you, Alicia and Joe Costa. I, I echo um, a, a lot of of what your uh, of your responses. Um, if there is a young, enthusiastic, dynamic leader who wants to run for office and 
it may not quite be their time. Um, I always ask folks the same three questions if they're considering. Um, what does leadership mean to you? What does representation mean to you? And what does community mean to you? I would never want to deter a young person from wanting to run for office because I don't think anyone needs permission to lead, especially not our younger generations. Um, but it is very important to understand um, how you're going to decenter yourself while trying to still center yourself in a campaign where you have to brand and sell yourself, right? Um, and I think the best people to advocate for communities um, and advocate for policies that directly impact uh, the people that you are in community with, it's very important to understand how you're going to represent them and what they mean to you. Um, so those are questions that I would ask that individual. And if they aren't quite developed in answering them, um, to definitely guide them towards trainings, tell them to look at, you know, who are community leaders around you and how have they built up those networks? How are you able to build relationships with them? Um, so much of what politics is, is relationship building. And if those aren't quite founded yet, it's important that they are guided in, in being able to build those. And so training sessions, working with other community leaders, and I'm not talking just in politics, look at who's doing mutual aid in your community, look at who are the nonprofit leaders are, uh, look at, you know, uh, get involved with, with schools in your community. Um, all of these folks are, are going to want to try to build a relationship to you at, with you at some point if you continue to pursue an office. But the folks right now, I think um, people desperately want uh, folks who care to run for office and the folks who care understand their communities. And so asking them those three things about what does community mean to you? What does leadership mean to you? What does representation mean to you? Um, if they feel confident in those answers, answers, um, you know, and they have powerful lived experiences that they're able to share as a, as a way to advocate for those folks, um, they may be ready. But if not, I would, I would continue to ask them those questions and have them focus on relationship building. Amazing advice. Um, as we saw in the chat, we have about 10 more minutes and then we'll take a break and the keynote address is right at three o'clock. Um, one last question, if no one has any, um, I think a great maybe piece to end on as well is um, we've touched on it a bit, but a common sentiment, especially so many people here are young college student organizers um, that do civic engagement work or voting work. Um, and we're in the Why Politics panel and so many times, um, I know I've seen it, and I know lots of other people have, when you're out there as a student trying to encourage other students to register to vote or to get involved, they just say, well, why politics? Why vote? It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't make it like it doesn't make a difference. They don't want to get involved. That's a really unfortunate common sentiment um, that they just dis they have a disbelief of the greater systems in place that will actually make a change for them. So obviously you all um, believe in the system. Um, do you have any advice on how to combat that or what to say to young people that are just sort of discouraged by voting in politics at large? Uh, hi, I'm Katie Montgomery. If I could weigh in, one thing that we do is work directly with our Secretary of State, and they count up how many um, elections end in a tie or decided by one vote. So, you know, over five years, it was 140. In our last election alone, it was 18. And when you tell a student that, we find a different engagement level because that one vote can restore hope that I can make a difference. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, Katie, I definitely want to build off of that. Um, sometimes, even if it's not one vote for the entire election? What if it's one vote in your ward or one vote in your district? Um, that's that's something where, um, you know, I play that up sometimes. So um, a great example is here in the city of Waukesha. Um, in the last spring election, we lost, um, our candidate lost by 34 votes. That's one turf. That's talking to literally you know, if you knock 40 doors and you put, even if you didn't talk to every single voter, if you would put literature on just 40 more doors, that, that would have been a win for us. Um, and so when you think about it that way and you break it down into those smaller increments, um, you know, in the primary, I was within 20 votes of my opponent. Um, and those, that, that can flip, right, um, in a general election. So, that's where you know my motivation personally is is there um and then when i mention that to other people um 
it, it motivates them, but it can also motivate them to talk to friends. Um, and I think that if you can kind of build that, um, you know, we call it multiplying the vote, right? So if you can get one person, that's great. But if that one person then talks to three more people, um, so sometimes it isn't about one vote, it's about your vote plus the three people that you've also told to vote, that you've told to register, that you've told to get involved. Um, and then if those three people talk to their three people, you know, it just gets bigger, it gets exponentially bigger. Um, and I think when you, when you bring it down to the little and then you tell them how big they can be, um, it, it makes it seem like less of an obstacle and, and less to overcome. Absolutely. And I'll share this too, to bring home that point, we started an interview series where we pair a student with an elected official who won by less than 10 votes. And we call it when a few votes made a difference. Great experience for the student. And um, one of the first people we um, interviewed told her story and she's now our congressional rep. So it was from her first city thing. She, she went to bed thinking she lost by six votes. She woke up the next day, found out she won by seven when they counted the absentee ballots. So it's just a powerful message, especially for people who've been impacted by COVID or whatever's going on in life that you don't have a say anymore. This is a way to have a say. I like that for, especially for students who are feeling so like they don't have control over so many things around them. Well, your vote is something you control completely. Yeah, I, I think too, um, you know, especially when you have um, younger candidates um, or women candidates or underrepresented candidates that are available. So kind of going back to why politics if you, if you get involved when you're younger, um, if you get involved as, as a member of maybe an underrepresented group, um, when I was talking to, so I actually do have um, a school within, within the district where I'm running. And um, when I talk to students, their concerns are very different from maybe the people who live right next door to me. Um, and so it is something where I am not as far removed because I'm, I'm, I'm 32. So I feel much older, but in, in the big scheme of things, I'm not actually that much um, farther removed. I'm, I'm looking through my Facebook memories and remembering fondly um, how great college was. But uh, one of the things that I was talking about was um, the, some of the college students around here are concerned about the lack of lighting uh, because it, it gets dark at night, obviously. And if the street lights aren't bright enough, people don't feel safe. But if you don't think about it as a student and you just think about it as somebody who wants their community to look pretty and you want these nice fancy lights that look nice but maybe don't provide as much light, um, there's two different perspectives there. But I think when you have younger people on the ballot or you have women who often are pedestrians. So even as a 32 year old woman, I walk most places um, because I, I live in a walkable community. Um, and so that is something that I think about. And, and so when you have somebody who motivates you to vote, those are the kinds of things to talk about with your friends as well. Hey, I talked to this woman, she's concerned about the lighting situation on campus as well. You, you know, you need to vote for her and you should tell all of your friends to do it too. She's gonna properly represent us. I hope that's what happens, Elise. Young people are more powerful than we give them credit for. So I would definitely first validate that feelings of disillusionment, exhaustion, fatigue, that government is broken is very valid because they haven't been working for you. But the people, if you look now, the folks getting shit done are younger folks. The, the massive movement building that can happen through organizing on social media. Um, just the other day, it was uh, Senator Ossoff who literally got a Senate confirmation hearing to get going because old white men in the room were bickering. It is young people who are our future. It is the young people that we need to have the most agency. And so having folks vote, having more young people vote, it is going to be um, where there is power and where there, where there needs to be more power building um, in politics. I mean, like what an amazing note to end it on, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, 
yeah, so I think there was just a pop up too. So I just want to once again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to you three amazing speakers for having time to chat with us this afternoon. Um, your, your words were invaluable. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and now um, we're pretty much good to wrap it up. You can return to the main session and then we'll have um, a little break here in the itinerary. And then we'll have, I believe our keynote speaker is right at three o'clock. Thank you all.